Hi, everybody. I'm James McDonald, Artistic Director of Western Canada Theatre. A couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of performing with the Vivace Chorale and Serious Options Choir with the works of Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales. We bring you A Child's Christmas in Wales as a gift for all of you during this season. Happy Holidays. One Christmas was so much like the other, now, in those years around the sea town corner, out of all sound except the distant speaking of voices, I sometimes hear a moment before sleep. That I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was 12, or whether it snowed for 12 days and 12 nights when I was six. All the Christmases roll down towards the two-tongued sea, like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street and they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves, and I plunge my hands in the snow, and I bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that wool-white, bell-tongued ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea, and out comes Mrs. Prothero and the fireman. It was on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve, and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden waiting for cats with her son, Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, although there were no reindeers. But there were cats. Patient, cold, and callous, our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats. Sleek and long as jaguars, and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slide and sidle over the white back garden walls, and the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, Fur-capped and moccasin trappers from Hudson's Bay off Mumbles Road would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still. Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday, that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden. Or, if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon, the voice grew louder. Fire! cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong. And we ran down the, the garden with the snowballs in our arms towards the house, and smoke, indeed, was pouring out of the dining room. And the gong was bombolating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing, Ruin! like the town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on a wall in a row. We bounded into the house laden with snowballs and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning, all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Prothero, who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face. But he was standing in the middle of the room, saying, A fine Christmas, and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, cried Mrs. Prothero as she beat the gong. They won't be here, said Mr. Prothero. It's Christmas. Well, there's no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke, and Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as though he was conducting. Do something, he said. And we threw our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero and ran out the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said, and the ambulance, and Ernie Jenkins. He likes fires. But we only called the fire brigade. And soon the fire engine came, and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house, and Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. And when the firemen turned off the hose and were standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered in at them. Jim and I waited, very quietly, to see what she would say to them. She said the right thing, always. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets, standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs, and she said, Would you like anything to read? Years and years ago, when I was a boy and there were wolves in Wales and birds the color of red flannel petticoats whisked past the harp-shaped hills, when we sang and wallowed all night and day in caves that smelt like Sunday afternoons in damp front farmhouse parlors, and we chased with the jawbones of deacons, the English and the bears, before the motor car, before the wheel, before the duchess-faced horse, when we rode the daft and happy hills bareback, it snowed 
and snowed. But here, a small boy says, it snowed last year too. I made a snowman and my brother knocked it down and I knocked my brother down and then we had tea. But that was not the same snow, I say. Our snow was not only shaken from whitewashed buckets down to the sky, it came shawling out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and hands and bodies of the trees. Snow grew overnight on the roofs of the houses like a pure and grandfather moss. Minutely ivy the walls and settled on the postman opening the gate like a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white torn Christmas cards. Were there postmen then too? With sprinkling eyes and wind cherried noses on spread frozen feet, they crunched up to the doors and mittened on them manfully. But all the children could hear was a ringing of bells. You mean that the postman went rat-a-tat-tat and the doors rang? I mean that the bells that the children could hear were inside them. I only hear thunder sometimes, never bells. There were church bells too. Inside them? No, no, no. In the bat-black snow-white belfries, tugged by bishops and storks, and they rang their tidings over the bandaged town, over the frozen foam of the powder and ice cream hills, over the crackling sea. It seemed that all the churches boomed for joy under my window, and the weathercocks crew for Christmas on our fence. Get back to the postman. They were just ordinary postmen, fond of walking and dogs and Christmas and the snow. They knocked on the doors with blue knuckles. Ours has got a black knocker. And then they stood on the white welcome mat in the little drifted porches and huffed and puffed, making ghosts with their breath, and jogged from foot to foot like small boys wanting to go out. And then the presents, and then the presents after the Christmas box. And the cold postman with a rose on his button nose tingled down the tea tray slithered run of the chilly glinting hill. He went in his ice bound boots like a man on fishmonger slabs. He wagged his bag like a frozen camel's hump, turned the corner on one foot, and by God, he was gone. Get back to the presents. They were the useful presents. Engulfing mufflers of the old coach days and mittens made for giant sloths, zebra scarfs of a substance like silky gum that could be tug-of-war down to the galoshes, blinding tam shanters like patchwork tea cozies and bunny-suited busbies and balaclavas for victims of tribes from aunts who always wore wool next to the skin. There were mustached and rasping vests that made you wonder how these aunts had any skin left at all. And once I had a little crocheted nose bag from an aunt now, alas, no longer whinnying with us. And pictureless boys in which small boys, though warned with quotations not to, would skate on Farmer Giles's pond and did and drowned. And books that told me everything about the wasp, except why. Go on to the useless presents. <laughs> Bags of moist and many-colored jelly babies. And a folded flag and a false nose and a tram conductor's cap and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a catapult. Once, by a mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet. And a celluloid duck that made, when you pressed it, a most unduck-like sound. A mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow. And a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea, and the animals any color I please. And still the dazzling sky blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow build and pea green birds. Hard boils, toffee, fudge, and all sorts, crunches, cracknel, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter welsh for the Welsh and troops of bright tin soldiers who, if they could not fight, they could always run. And snakes and families, and happy ladders, and easy hobby games for little engineers, complete with instructions. And a whistle to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with a stick, to shake our picture off the wall. And a packet of cigarettes. You put one in your mouth, and you stood at the corner of the street, and you waited for hours in vain for the old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette. And then, with a smirk, you ate it. And then it was breakfast under the balloons. Were there uncles, like in our house? <laughs> there are always uncles at Christmas, the same uncles. 
And on Christmas mornings, with dog-disturbing whistle and sugar fags, I would scour the swathed town for news of the little world and find always a dead bird by the post office or the white deserted swings. Perhaps a robin, all but one of his fires out. Men and women wading, scooping back from chapel, with taproom noses and wind-bust cheeks, huddled their stiff black jarring feathers against the irreligious snow. Mistletoe hung from the gas brackets in all the front parlors. There was sherry and walnuts and bottled beer and crackers by the dessert spoons, and cats in their furabouts watched the fires. And the high-heaped fire spat, all ready for the chestnuts and the mulling pokers. Some few large men sat in the front parlors without their collars, uncles almost certainly, trying their new cigars, holding them out judiciously at arm's length, returning them to their mouths, coughing, then holding them out again as though waiting for the explosion. And some few small aunts, not wanted in the kitchen, nor anywhere else for that matter, sat on the very edges of their chairs, poised and brittle, afraid to break like faded cups and saucers. Not many of those mornings trod the piling streets. An old man, always, fawn bowler, yellow gloved, and at this time of year with spats of snow, would take his constitutional to the white bowling green and back, as he would take it wet or fire on Christmas Day or Doomsday. Sometimes two hale young men with big pipes blazing, no overcoats, and wind-blown scarfs would trudge unspeaking down to the forlorn sea to work up an appetite, to blow away the fumes, who knows, to walk into the waves until nothing was left of them but the two curling smoke clouds of their inextinguishable briars. Then I would be slap-dashing home, the gravy smell of the dinners of others, the bird smell, the brandy, the pudding and the mince coming to my nostrils. When out of the snow-clogged side lane would come a boy, the spit of myself, with a pink-tipped cigarette and the violet past of a black eye, cocky as a bullfinch, leering all to himself. I hated him on sight and sound, and would about to be put my dog whistle to my lips and blow him off the face of Christmas when suddenly he, with a violet wink, put his whistle to his lips and blew so stridently, so high, so exquisitely loud, that goblin faces, their cheeks bulged with goose, would press against the tinseled windows, the whole length of the white echoing street. For dinner, we had turkey and blazing pudding, and after dinner the uncle sat in front of the fire, loosened all their buttons, put their large moist hands over their watch chains, groaned a little, and slept. Mothers, aunts, and sisters scuttled to and fro, bearing tureens. Aunt Bessie, who had already been frightened twice by a clockwork mouse, whimpered at the sideboard and had some elderberry wine. The dog was sick. Auntie Dosie had to have three aspirins, but Auntie Hannah, who liked port, stood in the middle of the snowbound backyard singing like a big-bosomed thrush. I would blow up balloons to see how big they would blow up to, and then when they burst, which they all did, the uncles jumped and rumbled. In the rich and heavy afternoon, the uncles breathing like dolphins and the snow descending, I would sit among festoons and Chinese lanterns and nibbled dates and try to make a model man-o'-war following the instructions for little engineers and produced what might be mistaken for a seagoing tram car. Or I would go out, my bright new boots squeaking into the white world, or to the seaward hill, or to call on Jim and Dan and Jack, and to pad through the still streets, leaving huge deep footprints on the hidden pavement. I bet people will think there have been hippos. What would you do if you saw a hippo coming down our street? I'd go like this, bang! I'd throw him over the railings and roll him down the hill, then I'd tickle him under the ear and he'd wag his tail. What would you do if you saw two hippos? Iron-flanked and bellowing he-hippos clanked and battered through the scudding snow towards us as we passed towards Mr. Daniels' house. Let's post Mr. Daniels a snowball through his letterbox. Let's write things in the snow. Let's write Mr. Daniels looks like a spaniel all over his lawn. Or we walked on the white shore. Can the fishes see it snowing? The silent, one-clouded heavens drifted onto the sea. Now we were snow-blind travelers lost on the North Hills, and vast dewlap dogs with flasks round their necks ambled and shambled up to us. We returned home to the poor streets where only a few children fumbled with bare red fingers in the wheel-rutted snow and cat-called after us, their voices fading away, as we trudged uphill into the cries of dock birds and the hooting of ships out in the whirling bay. And then, at tea, the recovered uncles would be jolly and the ice cake loomed in the center of the table like a marble grave. 
Auntie Hannah laced her tea with rum because it was only once a year. Bring out the tall tales now that we told by the fire as the gaslight bubbled like a diver. Ghosts hooed like owls in the long nights when I dared not look over my shoulder. Animals lurked in the cubbyhole under the stairs where the gas meter ticked. And I remember that we went to St. Carol's once when there wasn't the shading of a moon to light the flying streets. At the end of a long road was a drive that led to a large house and we stumbled up the darkness of the drive that night, each one of us afraid, each one of us holding a stone in his hand in case and all of us too brave to say a word. The wind through the trees made noises as of old and unpleasant and maybe web-footed men wheezing in caves. We reached the black bulk of the house. What shall we give them? Hark the herald? No, Jack said. Good King Wenceslas, I'll count three. One, two, three. And we began to sing. Our voices high and seemingly distant in the snow-felted darkness round the house that was occupied by nobody we knew. We stood close together near the dark door. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. And then the small dry voice, like the voice of someone who has not spoken for a long time, joined our singing. The small dry eggshell voice from the other side of the door. A small dry voice through the keyhole. <laughs> And when we stopped running, we were outside our house. The front room was lovely. Balloons floated under the hot water bottle, gulping gas. Everything was good and shone over the town. Perhaps it was a ghost, Jim said. Perhaps it was trolls, Dan said, who was always reading. Let's go in and see if there's any jelly left, said Jack. And we did that. Always on Christmas night, there was music. An uncle played the fiddle, a cousin sang Cherry Ripe, and another uncle sang Drake's Drum. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death. And then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again, and I went to bed. Looking through my bedroom window, out into the moonlight and the unending smoke-colored snow, I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses. I could hear music rising from them up the long, steadily falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness, and then I slept. Merry Christmas. <laughs>